Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Ross Sorkin uh, of CNBC and the New York Times, and it is a privilege for me to be with everybody here. Uh, this is going to be, I have to say, a very special panel. I swear to you, there's, I don't actually think there's anything like what's about to happen here. Uh, I've been coming to Davos, I think, coming on 15 years, and I don't think we've ever had a conversation about space like this, nor what you may see in about a half an hour, uh, depending on uh, the great technology, we can always hope. Uh, we're going to have a conversation about space uh, and what is happening. It feels like there is so much uh, changing and shifting investments being made, uh, but also larger governance questions about space that are being raised as this uh, entire space, uh, to use the pun, if you will, uh, is shifting and growing in so many ways. Let me tell you who is with us uh, right now. Jo uh, Joseph uh, Osbacher is the Gen uh, Director General, European Space Agency, uh, and he's going to be helping us with a little bit of technical help in just a moment. Uh, Silvia Macario is the geospatial uh, engineer, uh, Kigali Hub in Rwanda. Uh, and William Marshall is here. He's the co-founder and chief executive officer of Planet Labs. And as I said to you, what's going to make this amazing? We're going to be going to space all together in just a little bit. And we're going to have a conversation uh, with Samantha Cristoforetti. Uh, she is an astronaut with the European Space Agency. She is up in space, and we're going to have a link with her in just a bit to discuss her own experience and what is going on. And boy, does she have a lot to say about what is going on. Um, <laughs> here's where I want to start this, though. And I'm going to start with Will at the end, if you could. I just set the table for us, because I think we're all trying to understand, and we see lots of headlines about Elon Musk doing this, and Jeff Bezos doing this, and the Europeans doing this, and the Russians doing this. How do you see it? What's the opportunity? But also, where are the fault lines right now? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think there is a, a space renaissance going on. It's an exciting time for space, no doubt. Um, we are seeing reusable rockets. We're seeing space tourism. We're seeing missions to the moon and Mars, even private missions to the moon. Um, but I would say that uh, behind the scenes, there's a couple of things that are driving that. One is lower cost rockets and therefore reduced cost of accessing space. We've seen rocket costs come down about 5x over the last five to 10 years. And then what we're also seeing is the increasing cost performance of satellites. Um, we've seen those change for about 1,000x over the last five to 10 years, same period. Um, and so it's a bit like the uh, mainframe to desktop computer time frame for space. And it's, it's bringing out radical new capabilities, just like that time in computer industry brought out new capabilities. But the real upshot, which I think is the sort of behind the scenes what's going on, the upshot of that is actually a, is nothing to do with rockets or satellites or the moon or Mars. It's actually to do with data and AI and the Earth economy and, and how we're helping both sustainability with massive new data sets, because we, we're producing 10 times more imagery and information about the Earth's surface. Our own company has 200 satellites. We image the whole Earth every day. It's a brand new sort of data set. There's other companies doing other things like that. So we have brand new data sets to help us to take care of planet Earth. And we have more communication bandwidth to send information around the planet. And all of this amounts to ways in which we can help us to take care of the sustainability of the planet and help take care of situations like in Ukraine right now, where we're shedding light and bringing about global transparency and accountability. To the problems that yep. you were saying, there's a couple facing us. We have space debris, um, our environment challenge in, in space. Um, and just like the environment on the Earth, the sooner you nip it in the bud, the better. And we have tools to do that. But there's some challenges of, of governance there and also ownership. Um, there's a lot of competition going to take place on the moon, even though the moon is quite big. It's the size of the African continent. The areas of interest are in the poles where there's all the water, for example. And so everyone's going to want to go there. And the peaks of eternal light where all the power resources are. And so everyone's going to be zooming in some areas. But we haven't really sorted out who can own what and, and how do people have property rights, if at all, in space. And so uh, we've got very basic rules, but we need more established rules going into more more details on that. So there's just a couple of the problems that are going to be faced in the space community. OK, I want to have a debate about that in just a moment. But Sylvia, I want to ask you this. Uh, for those who are listening to us now and who say to themselves, why are we spending all this money out there when we should be spending money here, you tell them what? 
Right, thank you so much. First of all, I wanted to make a little correction. I'm a global shaper from the Kigali Hub. Yes. And I'm a geospatial engineer and space technologist. And so the importance of space, as well as highlighted, is very fundamental. We are using space technology every day, every single day. The, the thing is we need to do more awareness as space technologists or space engineers or engineers and scientists working in space. You, you, when you came here or when you're trying to find a place to, to go eat during your Davos event, you used Google Maps. That is due to space technology. You are probably using, uh, when you use the shuttles, there is walkie-talkies being used in the shuttles. That is due to space technology. So once we start creating that awareness on the importance of space technology and how it can be used to track disease, to help monitor the environment, then we will pull all the public to understand and go with us that space technology is indeed important for the general population and it's not for just a few billionaires. You mentioned uh, a, few, uh, a few billionaires, and let me ask you this. Um, there's been a debate about the privatization of space, and given the, the public uh, piece of this that you represent, how do you see this public-private um, either partnership, but also debate about who should own so much of space? I mean, there's a huge uh, debate, as you say, uh, between uh, private and public, uh, but let me just say one one more word, what Silvia was saying, and I really like uh, your statement of uh, space needs to be made for people because it has to help people, and uh, there are many tools that are uh, really helping people in all countries uh, across the globe. I mean, we have uh, climate research, uh, agriculture, uh, in case of natural disasters. There's a lot of uh, information that comes every single day uh, to people in need. Uh, Ukraine is a, a very good example where people really rely on the information in order to do what needs to be done. But coming back to, Andrew, what you say about uh, public and private. Yes, I am from the uh, uh, public side, but I'm a big fan of uh, commercialization. Uh, when I became DG about a year ago, I put uh, priorities, a strategy on the table of what uh, we should do in Europe. I'm in charge of uh, uh, the European Space Agency in Europe, what we should do in order to really foster and develop the commercial sector. And there's a lot to be done. Of course, I have been inspired by Silicon Valley and the companies there. In fact, I was visiting uh, uh, Will's uh, company some uh, time ago uh, and many others, SpaceX, uh, Google, and, and many others. And what I took home from, uh, from that uh, trip where I took my most critical managers with me because I had to convince them that we have to change gear in, in Europe is that in order to succeed, uh, you need actually do three things. Number one, you need talented people who are driven by an, by an idea, uh, who have uh, the energy to do it and just uh, are ready to, to go for it. You need access to money. Uh, of course, this is always uh, useful, and here in Davos, of course, uh, a very hot debate. But also, you need to be fast and dynamic and really respond to it quickly. And I think we can do that. So in Europe, uh, we are building up this new commercialization. Uh, and uh, what very few people, I think, realize is that uh, even the big companies, take Elon Musk as, uh, as, uh, the, uh, as a good example, uh, SpaceX, uh, SpaceX has been built together with NASA, and he's very grateful to NASA, and uh, as uh, he also said publicly, because NASA has been providing a lot of expertise, engineering and uh, uh, technical expertise, but also funding to build up uh, the uh, Falcon uh, rocket, as, as you know, about $4 billion uh, US dollars have been uh, uh, put in from public money to build up uh, SpaceX, uh, SpaceX uh, the Falcon uh, rocket. I think that's also a model I would like to adopt in Europe, to make sure that public investment is fostering new companies, small and big, in order to really have a very vibrant commercial landscape, which we need to have. Let's talk about property rights, if we could, because it's a fascinating issue. Um, here on Earth, for a very long time, if you got there first, it was yours. That's how we did it. And so the question is, um, how you see this playing out in space? Uh, who shows up on Mars first? You know, is it Elon's, for example? If Elon gets there first, does he get to keep it? Does Jeff Bezos get the moon if he wants, if he gets there? If, you know, how, how is this supposed, honestly, how is this supposed to work? And do you imagine that there is going to be wars waged in space over property? I mean, this is uh, certainly a discussion we have, and there is there's very limited rules today in place to regulate what happens on the moon. Let's assume somebody goes there, 
is putting up a big factory of, uh, uh, for example, getting resources from the moon. Uh, there are quite a few which we expect to be. And uh, very right question. If you put there your tools and your, your caterpillars or whatever you have, uh, can you stay there? Uh, and what happens if somebody next door wants exactly the same access to these resources? Actually, this is not settled today. Uh, there is a moon treaty, but not signed up uh, by, by some important countries. Uh, there's an Artemis Accord, which is uh, also on the table, again, not signed up by everyone. So it is, uh, there are some initiatives and there's a lot of discussion, but uh, to be frank with you, it is not properly regulated. What do you think, Will? Yeah. Well, can I just add? Yeah, I mean, I think this needs to be resolved for clarity for the economic development as well, um, and for human interest, because it shouldn't be just the first, first come, first serve, wild west sort of scenario. That's not going to be good for humanity. Um, but I would say that um, there is, a, you know, the Outer Space Treaty does say that um, countries, and it implies, because of the way international law works, companies cannot own the moon, cannot, although there are companies right now that are talking about going there and landing on the South Polar Moon and claiming ownership of parts of the moon. They can't actually do that. But as Yosef is saying, when you get into the details, they can land there, but, but can they, if they, they extract resources, is that then theirs? Um, what if somebody lands next to them? What if it's close proximity? There's all these details which, you know, if you stack up the law of the land, it's like yay high. The law of the sea, it's yay high. The law of the air, it's yay high. And the law of space, it's like this. <laughs> you know, we've got five treaties. And we're just at the very beginning. Uh, and, and it needs to be a collaborative venture between all the different actors, current and future, to take into account the needs of everyone. And is that a, and, uh, Sylvia, and, and just everyone can jump into this, is that a private-public uh, partnership that we're talking about? Do you think that that is nation states that have to effectively create those rules? I, just, and just to read you, there's a report back in January that NATO uh, put together a policy. NATO will consider an attack against a member country's assets in space as an assault on the alliance, and such actions could lead to a coordinated armed response from all members uh, if necessary. And that attack, of course, would be on Earth. So this is, this is a fascinating sort of development to sort of think about what this could potentially mean. Well, right. I, yeah, no, you, you, you. So during the advent of space, uh, we had very few nations trying to come up with legislation on how to access space. That put limitation to other countries trying to access space, and it is what it is to, up to today. And more countries are trying to get into space. We obviously have the International Telecommunication Union, which is charged with spectrum allocation to offer opportunities for countries to launch satellites to space. But we, ha we are progressively working towards that. But I want to put a different perspective on what we talk about in terms of colonization of space. It gives a really bad vibe in terms of coming from a country in the African continent where colonialism actually really decimated opportunity and potential. When you think about Mars, we, I think as scientists and everybody else looking into Mars, we think that there are no beings in Mars. But what if there are beings in Mars and we are talking about colonization of Mars, when potentially there could be beings who are actually surviving off of Mars. So changing that narrative is really incredibly important. And that's why we need all nations on board, on the table, trying to create legislation that works for everyone and not just a few countries. Speak to it, because this, this, yep. this, this is your business. And, and do you think you can get all the countries in the world around the table? And are there going to be countries that are going to try to splinter off in the same way we're having conversations about globalization and we're talking about deglobalization? I mean, this is uh, a big challenge, and you're absolutely right, uh, Andrew. I think this is um, maybe, from a legislative point of view, the biggest challenge we are facing. Of course, technology is the one we are dealing with every day and building the rockets and uh, building the spacecraft uh, to make it possible. But equally challenging is really the rules of engagement and the rules of behavior there. Uh, we have a, a forum that does that. Uh, the United Nations uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs uh, is the, the entity, and uh, COPOS uh, is the, the body that uh, is dealing with uh, international legislation re related to space. Uh, however, to be very, uh, very clear, it is a very slow machinery, and it is something that uh, needs a lot of uh, time to really form this consensus. And I think this is something that, uh, that uh, we see. But uh, there is no other body. Uh, there is not uh, any, anyone else that can regulate. But let me come to something you, you mentioned earlier, um, which is uh, space debris, uh, where we have a, 
a real life situation today. The moon is still a bit further away, right. and until the moon is getting uh, uh, used uh, for resources, uh, there are still a couple of years to come. But in space, uh, in orbits, uh, space debris is an issue today because we we have millions of particles of the size of uh, a centimeter flying around uh, to track them to know uh, whether they hit the space station. And in fact, one of my employees, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, with whom we are talking in a couple of minutes, is out there. And I'm worried about her because uh, she is in danger of uh, space debris. And this comes from ASATs, uh, as they are called, anti-satellite tests, uh, which are creating new clouds of, uh, of space debris. We had uh, the most recent one in uh, uh, just in fall last year, 15,000 new particles coming there. And another astronaut, Matthias Maurer, who was up there at this point, he had to go into the, the, the vehicle, the, the um, Orion space capsule, to take shelter uh, together with the other astronauts because they are safer than the space station itself. And this is a problem. This is a problem for astronauts, but also satellites up there. What is the solution? What's the solution? There are. Uh, Two types of solutions. One, of course, is the more, I would say, formal way of dealing with it through space traffic management, and we are putting programs together uh, to do that. So, first of all, to know where space debris is, and then to have rules of engagement how to behave, like traffic rules on the on, on the surface or uh, rules uh, for aviation. Uh, and the same is being discussed in space. But there's also the very practical aspect, which is those who are having satellites just call each other. I mean, there is, of course, uh, mm -hmm. not a red phone, but this is uh, all. Uh, very automated, but call each other and say, look, your satellite is colliding or is about to collide with mine. We need to do what we call an, an orbit uh, avoidance, a collision avoidance maneuver. So one needs to go up, the other one goes down, and then they, they, they avoid each other. And this is happening on a routine basis uh, through the various operators of the satellite. So they are practically, uh, those people or those operators and owners of satellites are work very well together. Well, can I, can I ask you, this is just a, a broader question, but it's about what I would call the good guys and the bad guys, <laughs> which is your company right now is working with the Pentagon to track Russian troops mm -hmm. from, from up in the sky. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, absolutely. But also, yeah. and this is the good guy, bad, it's being used, I would argue, because I think of you as one of the good guys. But I can also see how this type of technology could be used by one of the bad guys and how we are all supposed to think about that. Well, let me just explain in the context of Ukraine, because I think that's really um, illustrative. I mean, firstly, w when we started Planet, the primary goal is about helping us understand and take care of the planet, like monitoring deforestation and ice caps and, and helping businesses like in agriculture and all these things that can benefit from this sort of data. The same rules apply. That to, it's the same uh, theory of change, which is that um, you can't manage what you don't measure. And uh, so we're having data on a faster timescale that help us to manage all these problems. This is bringing accountability on the sustainability side. It's the same on the security side. We are imaging all of Ukraine every day, like we're imaging every other place on the planet every day. And you, know, you can't get away with large-scale troop build-ups without everyone noticing. We help provide that uh, to entities in defense of Ukrainian sovereignty right now. We also provide it to humanitarian organizations that are trying to bring relief efforts, so medical supplies to people in Ukraine, take care of refugees, displaced people within Ukraine. There's 7 million people displaced within Ukraine. And finally, we're trying to, where appropriate, show that to the news media. A lot of the, when you see the images on the front page of the New York Times, yep. your, your, your outlet has, has had our imagery on a few times in the last month where we've been showing the systematic destruction of civilian infrastructure in, in uh, Mariupol, for example. Um, and, in each case, it's cooling out what Putin was saying is doing the opposite. You know, are we withdrawing troops? Oh, well, we see them uh, building a bridge over here, exactly in the opposite. We're not hitting civilian targets. We point that out. And everyone gets to see this through putting it online and putting it in the hands of journalists to expose that to the world. I think that's playing a significant part in cohering the West. There's no longer debate. <laughs> You know, this is, and it brings everyone closer to what's going on. We get to see it in real time. Everyone gets to see it, not just the CIA and the KGB. Everyone gets to see it. it go, and that's, I think, a lot of why uh, Switzerland has become less neutral. Sweden and Finland are talking about joining NATO. Germany is, is increasing its uh, military budget and so on. It's, and, it's, and the coherence of the West in response to Ukraine is because everyone's on the same page about exactly what's going on, what Putin is doing, and what. Uh, and, 
it can be used uh, for bad purposes. I mean, I worry about it being used for, uh, uh, for targeting civilians, for example. But it's extremely hard to do that, actually. And the, what it's generally useful for is wide-scale scanning for, uh, and, and the more people that access that data, the better. So we have a non-exclusivity principle. So we will never give an image to one person that we won't sell to others. And that ensures that in any conflict, there's multiple eyes. It is, the New York Times gets to look at it. The UN gets to look at it. The Ukrainians get to look at it. And, then, and, then, and that's going to serve everyone better uh, because it's when there's misinformation and when there's a lack of information that there's miscalculation in wars. If you go back to the Cold War, it was when the US put missiles in Turkey and the Russians didn't know that it almost got hot, or when the Russians put missiles in Cuba and the US didn't know that things almost got hot. When people knew about each other's activity, it was better. We are bringing, helping to bring transparency to the whole world, to everyone, instead of just the two superpowers, as was then. And I think that that generally enhances peace and security. Sylvie, what do you think about competition in space? I think we need to redefine capitalism. That's also, that has been my discussion with Minor Earth. task. <laughs> <laughs> but when you have Will here, he will say that, that we shouldn't do that. But for me, no, I would totally agree with you. Redefine capitalism. Absolutely. Okay, let's finish. What do you mean? Let's Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. <laughs> no, I mean, the whole idea of space technology and the amount of capital needed to accelerate space technology is very intense. It's very massive. And that's why we need collaborative efforts across countries or across nations, if you will. And bringing along individuals who are working in, in different sectors to understand the value that space brings to us from the point of solving climate change, for example. But then these discussions are not happening with the right people. We are constantly the same people over and over in the same rooms. How can we advance this conversation to ensure that the right people are in the room and the right people here, I don't mean just white and male only. We need women in the table. We need young youth leaders on the table who understand issues in their communities and how space technology can actually solve that. If we have that and working with frameworks that actually make sense, then maybe we can redefine capitalism. There but you is, but is your sense, I guess the question though is, is the capitalistic uh, incentive structure, the right structure for the new frontier, if you will? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but can I just uh, touch on this, that um, I think it's super important um, the whole of humanity has to redefine capitalism to take into account the, the nat natural capital. We have to, every company has to measure its ESG targets. Every country must measure its emissions and we need to put that into the capital system, otherwise we're going to screw up this planet. I mean, we're on the, the course for that. Uh, also, um, to your point about what's right in the long term, I mean, I think there's, there is, it's a good idea to think about new forms of capitalism. Um, we went public just last year and we did so as a public benefit corporation. And that actually writes in the mission of our company into the chart of the organization. Now, the board of directors have a fiduciary duty to look at the mission. And it's basically use space to help humanity, basically, is the mission of our company. And now they have a fiduciary duty to execute against that. And I think that's fantastic. Because this isn't just about dollars and cents. This is about building long-term prosperity. And I think if we address big long-term challenges uh, that the world faces, uh, from climate change to security, um, we will create real value. And, 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 and that's the right thing. I think there's a trillion dollar but, but, economy me... around space um, in the next few right. years, uh, but, uh, but we should do it in the right way. Just, yeah, no, just, um, uh, I think space, or especially Earth observation is, uh, is a tool, or space in general, but Earth observation in particular is a tool which really can help people all over the globe, because it's not stationed somewhere over a certain point because satellites do fly around. Uh, and the information which is gained is actually helping everywhere. I mean, let's start with climate change. We would not know uh, the massive uh, impacts of climate change if we wouldn't have satellites. Uh, so we, we only know what we know uh, because we have this information. The other question, of course, is are we doing something about it? Or right. Are we doing enough? But uh, the information is there, and we get them uh, through these means. The other part, and this, I think that's extremely important, that I really like uh, uh, your bit provocative statement, Silvia. I think we have to more, much more massively use this data for Africa, 
for other parts of the world and not only by white males, as you, as you uh, call it. I think this is absolutely important. And we'd have huge programs. Uh, we work with the World Bank. We work uh, with Africa. Myself, I was initiating programs uh, in 2002 after the World Summit of Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, as we just said before uh, this meeting here, to really use space for sustainable development. Uh, the SDGs are using data from space. There's plenty of it, but you're right. We have to make sure this goes down to the people and into the hands of people and not just uh, in, in some communities. And I think that's a challenge and that we need to work more. I want to pivot the conversation in just a moment, but I do want to mention to the WEF folks who are with us, if you could get the countdown clock rolling, because uh, I do know that we are waiting uh, for the space station uh, to uh, get into uh, exactly where we need them so that we can... Uh, <laughs> We, we can actually make the connection, which we're going to do, but I know that that countdown clock uh, needs to, uh, uh, needs to uh, begin for us, uh, I hope, in just a moment. Here's where I want to uh, go with you, though, politically. And it's actually kind of interesting because we're going to talk to Samantha in just a bit. Um, there's a Russian astronaut uh, up there, two, two of them. Uh, and how you think about the collaboration between certain countries that have, by the way, enormous... Um, background and expertise in space and what it means in the future, given what's happening on the ground here, about what that means in terms of uh, future endeavors. I mean, this, uh, Andrew, has been uh, my headache of the last couple of months and weeks uh, to deal with the geopolitical situation and what does it mean for space. So let me just uh, maybe in one or two sentences say what, uh, what happened. After the 24th of February, I immediately had to make decisions whether or not to launch uh, ExoMars uh, rover uh, to Mars with Russia, which was uh, built up for 15 years. Of course, within a split second, uh, after consulting my member states, the decision was made that we suspend this cooperation and we do not launch uh, with Russia. Of course, this poses a huge problem uh, now to me because uh, we have a, a rover ready to be launched. Uh, it was about to be shipped to Baikonur, and uh, of course, we could not, uh, which now we need to disentangle at least those components that, that are Russian components and replace them with European ones or possibly uh, from some other partners. So this is uh, a huge uh, thing we, we had to do and we are doing right now in order to really disentangle the economy just as we do it in gas or in energy, other right. energy, oil, gas and other domains where we have built up dependencies based on decisions by politicians at top level 20, 30 years ago that we should work together. Right. And now suddenly we can't anymore. Uh, uh, in space, I just hear there's a 10... We, got, we, got the 10 minute, we just got the 10-minute countdown, and now the clock is up, so we're, good. we're getting ready. Um, so, uh, talking of uh, the space station, since we just heard uh, the, the countdown is coming, uh, yes, there, uh, we have uh, Russian astronauts or cosmonauts uh, up there, together with our uh, astronauts and the uh, U.S. Uh, astronauts, and they need to work together, because if they don't, there's a problem for them up there and for us down here. Uh, so there we have really no choice than, uh, other than to, to work together, make it work, and, uh, and make sure that uh, the space station is safe, first and right. foremost, and the people up there are safe. Uh, I can say that it works on a routine basis because they just go about their job. There's a huge program of uh, work they have uh, every single day. Uh, they know they have to do this experiment to repair the station here, to uh, replace a, a piece of uh, equipment or electronics somewhere else, and they just do it, uh, regardless of... Uh, nationality or, or color or, or whatever. This is, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's important, um, but it's, uh, it's the way the astronauts are trained right. because they are really trained uh, just to make sure everything is going well and is going well. So that's the situation the now, given that they're up there. But how is this going to change in the future? How does it change? Uh, many of you have seen uh, some of the announcements on uh, Twitter space or other uh, news outlets uh, that... Uh, there is, uh, they, they might pull the plug and uh, therefore not anymore uh, work together on, on the space station. Uh, it's not that easy to start with uh, because uh, you, you need both units uh, to basically uh, uh, work safely together. Uh, secondly, uh, I can say that despite the rhetoric uh, which uh, you have all seen, it does work. Uh, it does work on a routine basis for whatever needs to be done. So I'm confident uh, in very in everyone's self-interest that uh, the space station is safe uh, and uh, that the safety of astronauts and people is the top priority, and uh, we continue doing that. Uh, and uh, we're doing this uh, in the daily program. You will hear it in a few minutes uh, from Samantha. She is going about her business. Right. William? I was going to come in that I want to say something slightly controversial, that, you know, right now, here and now, of course, we're, we're, we're in a tense situation with Russia 
Uh, but um, one of the amazing things about the International Space Station is that it's continued to work to come hell or high water on the Earth. And it's a symbol of cooperation. Now, it's a very difficult one, obviously, in this circumstance. Um, but the Apollo-Soyuz project uh, was the first uh, cooperation between Russia and the, Soviet, uh, and, and the US during the height of the Cold War. It was the first place where they cooperated. And then they agreed together to then build the International Space Station with the Europeans, the Canadians, the Japanese, and others. And um, I actually think it's hopeful that we have a place which is a little bit above, uh, beyond the politics, and that we go, look, long term, we need to cooperate. We need to be able to do that. I am hopeful that we will continue to keep space as a cooperative place, um, including all players. Um, there's tension right now about the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. and the US, um, for example. I would love to see the Chinese and the US work together on a space station or a moon base. It's probably the most natural thing, because I think that could be a symbol of cooperation to bring things together. We can't completely decouple. The, yeah. the discussions of decoupling the economies are it's impossible, and technology it's impossible. The scientific community, it's impossible. Well, there's certain areas we must, but there's certain areas where we must cooperate as well, and I hope that it remains that theatre of cooperation as well. Let, let me take another example, and uh, of course the space station is a very visible one, but the, the other area where we need to work together, we have no choice, is down on planet Earth for the future of our planet. Climate change. Climate change still exists, despite geopolitical tensions. Maybe, maybe even be intensified, climate change needs to be tackled by every single one. That means the information from all the countries, uh, from uh, Europe, from the US, uh, from Russia, from China, and everyone else. We need to work together to care for our planet. And there, we literally have no choice. How do you think about how some of the wealthier countries think about space relative to some of the more developing countries think about space? As I earlier mentioned, it's, it's, it's normally a fundamental an issue on the legislation and patenting and the research that comes off of space that impacts health or the health uh, sector or the um, just general, the internet in general and, and everything that is due to space. At the end of it all, we are looking at countries that have resources are able to put these technologies in space, and these technologies are able to help their people on the ground, right? And incidentally, you find that African countries have to pay huge amounts of dollars to access uh, imageries and, and to use this to either cooperate on food security or just disaster risk management in, in the monitoring of the environment in the African continent. But then at the same time, the issue becomes to what extent, to what end do we get to a point where spec spectrum allocation is available for various countries or the charity or the way maybe uh, we launches a satellite to space and then we have more than 100 countries, we don't have 100 countries, more than 50 countries trying to share on the on board on board of the satellite to, to launch this, uh, to get space to, to do research in their, in their own way. But then that incentive has to come from various nations cooperating yeah. and being able to, to do that. Sylvia is saying access to data is, is crucial. And uh, just a minute and a half. Uh, access to data is crucial. And uh, the Copernicus program, which we have developed uh, in, in Europe, is providing free data to everyone at any place of the world. And this is something I've been fighting for uh, more than 10 years ago now. And I'm very happy to say that these data, which we do provide, are for free to everyone. Uh, of course, you need an internet access, this is clear, or somehow accessing the data, and we help in doing that. But these data, we provide for free. And I think this is fundamental, because as you say correctly, uh, this should not be a privilege of some white uh, people somewhere in a, in a rich country in other, in other uh, worlds, but really for, for everyone. And we have right. huge projects where we help people to get access to it through low, low bandwidth uh, uh, technology. We're connecting to space yeah. in 30 seconds. What do you want to say? I only want to say it, it's been democratized. It's, the prices are coming down exactly. Uh, so I think that countries in Africa can leapfrog and come into the, uh, uh, utilizing right. the value of this new data set, where the free data sets are much reduced. We're, we're getting the countdown. Five. Four. Nope, hold nope, on. We're not launching into space. <laughs> we're, we're getting very close. He actually has a GPS of where 
Um, the station is. The station is right now. Oh, here we are. Right. And I believe That's that you there. can see right there, we're there. This is Houston. So what we see here. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? There's a fusion say yeah. Yes, we are. This oh, is this you. Is, oh, this is station. Houston, this is station. I'm ready for the event. European Space Agency and participants, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. This is ESA calling station. Are you ready for the call? Yes, sir, this is Station. I'm ready for the event. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. So, hello, Samantha. Very nice uh, to see you. We just uh, met uh, about a month ago when you were launched uh, into space, one day after your birthday, which was a very special moment. Uh, very happy to see you up there. You look very good and in very good shape, and I see you all smiles. Uh, I'm calling here from Davos, from the World Economic Forum, and uh, this is... Uh, a very special event down here on Earth, but you will tell us in a minute uh, how it is up there in space. So I'm, hand I'm handing over to Andrew. Andrew is the moderator of this session, and uh, he will now uh, moderate uh, this part. Hi, Samantha. It's great to see you. I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to give it a little bit of time between, between questions. We've been having a conversation uh, down here on Earth about actually a lot of the things that are happening uh, on Earth as it happens. And I wanted to understand from your perspective, in terms of your space exploration and your own research, how important the future cooperation is uh, between Russia and all of the various, what we might describe as space economies are right now. Yes, hello. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here to uh, hear the voice of our Director General, and uh, I'm very happy to, about this uh, conversation we are about to have with you, Andrew. Um, and to answer your question, well, the short answer is it's, uh, it's quite important, I would say. Uh, I think that the International Space Station, where I have the pleasure and the privilege of being right now, is a testament of, to international cooperation. And uh, certainly, uh, Russia is an important partner in, uh, in this endeavor. Uh, but just in, you know, and, and, and the space station, just to clarify, is really an integrated facility where um, components of provided by different countries and different agencies are integrated together and really can function only as a whole. Um, and that include the Russian segment, the USS segment, uh, and also this uh, uh, piece of Europe up here in space, which is the Columbus uh, Laboratory. Uh, so, but in, in general, uh, space exploration is indeed, uh, I think, an, an area of human endeavors in which uh, international cooperation has proven key uh, to achieve uh, success, and the ISS is really a testament to that. Um, maybe this is going to be a personal question, but uh, there are Russian cosmonauts uh, on board with you. Uh, how is it working with them? Um, do you discuss what's happening uh, in Ukraine and what's happening on the ground? You know, I think that on a on a personal level, we are we, you know we are all uh, uh, saddened and devastated by uh, the events uh, ongoing in the current conflict, and 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 that's a fact. Um, but at the same time, in terms of our relationships here on board, I think what prevails and and um, informs our relations and our work together on a daily basis is. On a personal level, our personal friendship to our, our colleagues, whom we have known for quite quite a long time, uh, and on a professional level, our, our common commitment to the success of the mission and to continuing of the amazing work of science and technological advancement that we uh, perform on a daily basis here on the International Space Station, which again is a product of integrated work of many international partners. Um. I was going to ask you, given the challenges that we're, we're clearly facing about inequality and climate change, and we talked about that a little bit down here before we got to you, can you tell everybody about the purpose of your mission and how, how you would tell everybody on Earth uh, how you think it's going to ultimately help resolve some of these issues?
Yeah, I, I think that global big challenges like uh, obviously climate change and inequality uh, have our best faced when societies have at their disposals powerful tools and those tools are knowledge, technologies and general, uh, uh, you know, strong economies. And so I think that there's two ways of answering your questions. I mean, of course, I could go and go off and tell you about all the space-based, all the space-based assets that monitor the Earth on a daily basis. And some appear by the some of those are, are free-flying satellites, but some of those are here installed on the external platforms of the International Space Station because they benefit from the fact that they have this platform and all the power that is available and you know the data transfer. Um, and so and, and you know and, and that it was possible to install them here. So I, I could go off and tell you that, but I, I think that one should also have a more holistic perspective and understand that space is really part of our lives, of our technological development, of our scientific advancements, ultimative, ultimately of our um, you know, economic resources and the technological and scientific resources that we overall have at our disposal to tackle challenges, especially like, like climate change. So as we develop space capabilities and the space economy, that becomes a multiplier of all the technological tools that we have at our disposals to tackle climate change and, you know, all the great challenges that face humanity. Um, what do you think, you know, we are in this, this new era of space exploration and there are billions of dollars pouring into it in, in, from the private sector. What do you think of that? And what do you think of what the private companies uh, can and, and will do up there? Yeah, I think that that is a, a very exciting and positive development. I think that a, uh, a cooperation between the private and the and the public sector uh, is going to bring us a lot of benefits. I think that the private sector, when it comes in, it probably brings um, an, an agility, uh, an ability to innovate, uh, you know, competition, the, the power of, of the market economy when it's brought upon the space business is, uh, is bound to, you know, be partially disrupted, but certainly help uh, develop it, uh, make it more resilient, make it more affordable from an economic point of view, so that, again, as I mentioned earlier, all these space capabilities can really be leveraged from many, many uh, diverse um, industrial, societal, economic uh, sectors. And, you know, space is not this thing out there doing things on its own, but it's integrated in the web of society and, uh, and economy. So this is, I think, the benefit that bringing in a lot of commercial actors will bring. Um, you know, the uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Columbus, the European Laboratory on Board. Externally to Columbus, we have an external platform, which is an example of this uh, uh, public-private partnership, which is uh, Columbus. In the rack right next to me, there is another example, which is the Ice Cube's uh, uh, research facilities. So, you know, also in Europe, there is, uh, um, you know, some of, of that um, private-public partnership already ongoing, and we're certainly striving to get that more and more. I want to turn the interview personal for a second. This is your second time up there. I've never, by the way, interviewed an astronaut in space uh, before. <laughs> so I want to know what it's been like and what's it like the second time? You know, there's always conversations here about coming to Davos your first time and what it's like the second time. <laughs> uh, what's it like the second time up there? Is it different? Have you, did you bring different things with you? Are you getting better sleep? What, what is it? How, just tell us about what, what the experience is like. Uh, the second time is very different, uh, not worse or better, but uh, different. I would say that the first time I came um, to space station as a rookie, it was quite overwhelming. Uh, you know, all the way from from launch, uh, it, it was this influx of, of new experiences, new physical sensations, new skills that I had to learn. You know, like like floating in, in zero g uh, and handling this uh, rather complex environment of uh, of space station and handling the work up there or up here. Um, and and I, I think um, if I looked back at those, especially those first days and weeks, it was all a little bit of a blur. I didn't have very clear memories. And so I was really looking forward to come up here a second time as a veteran astronaut this time and have a little bit more of both cognitive and emotional buffer to experience this a little bit more in slow motion. And it's definitely been the case. I mean, you know, the, I didn't have to learn everything from scratch. It came it came back to me fairly quickly, like riding a bicycle, I guess. Uh, and so I, I had that space in, you know, in, in, in my heart and in my mind to... Um, 
observe the experience and, and really take note of details and, and hopefully also remember it better uh, for, for the future. What's the most exciting thing you're working on up there right now? Well, this weekend we had uh, quite an excited event. We actually had a brand new um, a space vehicle. It's called uh, Starliner. Uh, that uh, so the prototype, the, uh, the demonstration flight uh, occurred this weekend. So uh, the vehicle came knocking at our door um, in the night between Friday and Saturday, I believe. And uh, we had a pretty intense, uh, short uh, docked mission in which it uh, demonstrated a number of uh, of capabilities. And then we uh, closed the hatch uh, uh, last night, and it will undock. And, and of course, we are, uh, we are all uh, confident that we will safely land to Earth um, uh, shortly after that. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, the, there's always a lot of uh, science on board. It's always difficult to pick a favorite, but I will let just uh, Simi to choose for me, like what you maybe can glance here in the camera uh, that I'm not supposed to touch, but I set up yesterday is a, a, a facility to demonstrate uh, tele-robotic operations. So once we are uh, ready to do the, the, the demonstration operations, I will actually use this, uh, um, it, it's like a, a haptic controller. So I will hold it in my hand and kind of, move my hand, but actually on the ground, I will be moving remotely the hand of a robot to perform tasks uh, um, remotely. So that, that's pretty exciting. That's uh, stuff that is uh, is going to be useful for future um, surface explorations of, of Moon and, and hopefully one day of Mars. Um, and I don't know if this audience knows this, and this is so cool, I think. Uh, she has been a great champion of women and uh, space engineers and uh, Mattel, the toy maker, has made and commissioned uh, a Barbie doll of Samantha. <laughs> and I just thought maybe you could tell us about that, how it came about. I don't know if you have one up there with you, um, but it, it, it sounds like a fact. How did that happen? Yeah, um, they have this uh, campaign, which I believe is like the Dream Gap campaign, and uh, the idea is to uh, provide young girls, really, you know, especially starting at a young age, like preschool age, with uh, role models, uh, so that you know they don't, they keep dreaming big. Uh, they do not start to think already, like in preschool age, that some professions are maybe not suitable for them, some career paths, some, uh, you know, some disciplines that they can study um, in college, for example, are not suited for them. Yeah, that, that's what we want to prevent. You know, when I encourage women to, you know, to, to, to consider STEM careers, sort of consider working in the space sector, I don't necessarily have an end state in mind, because, I mean, it, it depends in the end on individual choices and individual freedom, which for me is sacred. But what I, I hope to help accomplish is that, you know, young, you know, girls and, and women feel that freedom. They, you know, they, they, they make those choices knowing that they are free to choose from, you know, the full palette of, of human enterprises. Uh, Samantha, you're an inspiration. Uh, we are, I'm super grateful uh, to have this conversation with you. We want to thank you for joining the World Economic Forum in Davos from space. Um, and we want to thank you. <laughs> Um, I hope we get to do this again and talk to you uh, very, very soon. Maybe uh, we'll, we'll call and do a Zoom together at some point. I don't, what time is it there for you? Do you have to go to bed? I don't know, I don't know if it's the morning or night. Uh, it's about 10 to 3, so we should just uh, be a couple of hours behind. So it's, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, Andrew, and uh, to you, DG, and to everybody in, uh, in Davos. I, I thank you for your interest and for visiting me up here on the International Space Station. Great. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was fun. H how often do you get to talk to her? Um, actually, I talked to her soon after she arrived at the space station uh, because uh, there were two astronauts of visa there, one from Germany and uh, Samantha uh, from Italy. And uh, we had a connection with uh, the, the leaders of space in those countries and myself, uh, which was about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago. So I do have these conversations, I would say, every three weeks, two to three right. weeks. And it's always fun, it's always better. But the best one I had, and this was completely unexpected, um, was on my birthday. I got a phone call from space uh, by my astronaut uh, up there, uh, was uh, Thomas Pesquet, 
And uh, I don't know how he knew, but he called me and said, Joseph, this is uh, your astronaut calling from space. Happy birthday. And this was fantastic. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, are you guys going to space? What's, 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 what's the plan? You, you mean? Going? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, whenever the opportunity opens. Do you think that we're all going to be going? I mean, do you think everybody in this room is ultimately going to be in space? I mean, in, in our lifetime, this is going to be a, a, a thing? So. Absolutely. I think it's a thing. I mean, the, the prices are coming down. We're going to see it becoming more and more tractable. It's if you want to. I mean, uh, you... But what are we going to be doing? Are we just going for the 11-minute ride? Or is there actually more to this than just to sort of uh, the amusement of it? Well, I think there is more to it than the amusement. I mean, I, mean, I, I love the idea. I think the biggest thing will be space tourism for a while. I don't think that's the biggest effect of space, on, as we said. This is a trillion-dollar economy helping us to take care of the planet. But I think it's really, I mean, just this experience, again, reminds us how inspiring space can be, how it can be a, a place of international cooperation despite the challenges on the Earth, as well as reminding us of the technology that it brings that help us understand our climate, understand our challenges on the Earth, the same is true, like when, you know, we're trying to image the Earth to help everyone see what Samantha is seeing when she looks out the window. But, of course, there's nothing quite that's going to replace going up there and having a look for yourself and going up there. I personally love to go to the moon to see the whole Earth from the moon because it would be four times the size of the, the moon is in the, in the Earth sky. And you just imagine this big orb. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing to do that? If, if it's possible, I'd love to go, and I'm sure many people here will do in our lifetimes because it's... it's the, it's, it, we're in a space renaissance and it's having dramatic changes to the cost. Yeah. When uh, the astronauts uh, come back, uh, of course, I usually receive them uh, uh, in our astronaut center. And uh, I asked them, I asked everyone the same question. I said, look, when, when, when you come down here, what is your biggest memory and what, what is your biggest impression you are, you are having from space and what you want to convey? And every single one, in different words, but everyone is saying, Look, up there, you see our planet very differently, and I've become a very, very sustainable person because I realize how thin the atmosphere is and how vulnerable our planet is. It's beautiful, but also very fragile, and we have to, we have to protect it. In fact, one astronaut was saying, I wish that every single citizen of this planet can come up to space and see it from there because then they would behave differently. Right. Sylvia, what were you going to say? I think most of the astronauts that go to space whenever they come back, it's the change of perspective on how you are, the Earth is a very tiny block from the International Space Station, and then you get to see how insignificant sometimes you are as a human like, being, and how cooperation and just collaborating together and loving on one another is important. You can't, if you can't cooperate, then we end up destroying our Earth, and we do not know if Really, we have another Earth to go to. So we have to be okay. very, very careful on that. You don't see boundaries from up there. Yeah. You don't see boundaries. You don't see different people. You see a planet. And I think that uh, that view uh, would be very helpful for many of us. On that note, I want to thank you all for the conversation. I want to thank you all for joining us. What a fantastically inspiring discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.